formally trained at all in sewing, but like how I learned was from my mom and from following patterns. It's one of my favorite hobbies. I do it all the time. And one thing that like, as I've gotten more into sewing and has, as it's become a much more practical thing for me, um, before it was kind of just like mending or just throwing things together, which I think is a really awesome way to learn. Like as it's become more important to like how I consume clothing, something that I've realized is that um, all clothing is handmade. And so like when I think about like how can it be possible for a shirt to cost $10 when like I know that there's like hours of labor that go into this, whether that's like creating the textiles to sewing them together, no matter how simple it is, like that's done by human hands like that's like real labor that happens um and yet like that diminished cost is also part of democratizing fashion like that's why we don't have this top-down structure of fashion of like certain um like rarefied individuals deciding what's worth buying or what's worth engaging with like now that fashion and textiles and clothing is more accessible than it ever has been like that also means that like everyone's able to like actively participate rather than maybe more passively participating um but at the same time like the ability to make our own clothes is something that's kind of been taken away from us um it used to be taught in schools it used to be like it had to be i mean in the last hundred years like not even it's like something you have to know how to do and that's kind of not the case anymore we're like so removed from the labor that like creates the world we live in so that's kind of like what i think about when i'm making clothes it's skilled labor um it has to be performed because we all get dressed in the mornings but like the price no longer at all reflects what goes into it so kind of my thinking with making this workshop is making this like it's a wedding dress and what's funny is like i was just thinking this morning how my mom the, when I took a sewing workshop once, the teacher was like, oh, I made my own wedding dress. And my mom privately later was like, oh, it's bad luck to make your own wedding dress. But like that, that thinking comes from like 1960s, 70s consumer culture, which is like everything has to be purchased. Like even our superstitions and our stories are like telling us that we have to purchase and consume rather than making our own. So I'm making this wedding dress. I'm not getting married. <laughs> I'm just making a wedding dress because I want to think about the time that it takes to like create something like this and like just the practice of like creating and I think that like sewing is actually accessible at any skill level like when I started I was like mending jeans but I was also like throwing together dresses that like functionally not wearable like I was using fabrics I like would never suggest a beginner to use, but at the same time, like you can start at any level, you can just jump in, like if you have a sewing machine. So like sewing for joy is such like an important part of like my development as a person and like how I, you know, keep it together day to day. <laughs> um, so that's kind of like what I was thinking about all the things I thought about when I was making this project, designing this project, like thinking about how I wanted to share what I care about the most when it comes to sewing and like how I wanted to share like what goes into sewing, but also how like incredibly accessible and amazing it is to be able to like make your own clothes and engage in things like sewing and fashion, like completely from the other side rather than as a consumer, but as like someone who's creating their clothes, not even for profit, but for themselves. So <laughs> with all that said, <laughs> Yeah, and this is a really cool project because it, it requires an immense amount of material, right? It's actually like really brings into that, uh, the dialogue, that question of accessibility. <laughs> like how accessible is it? How many yards of fabric is it? Um, it's like six yards for the underdress and then I think seven or eight yards of netting for the overdress. It's like 2000 square feet of fabric. It's something really wow. wild. <laughs> Well, so we're going to watch you um, get started on making it from fully start to finish or as far as we can get in, in the time we have together. Yeah, there might be some sewing that happens outside of the, um, the like specific context of this because I do not think I'm going to get very far in two hours. But also like I'm very happy to like talk about making clothes, talk about getting started. So there might be like pauses in this process to talk about, okay, okay, once you actually, like, it's all, 
it's all fun to talk about making clothes, but once you actually want to get started, like where's a good place to start? What are some suggestions? Stuff like that. So I definitely want to talk about that. If anyone has questions at any point, I would love to answer them. I love talking about like home sewing um, or just like, like I'm a big proponent of like, if you think you want to sew something, just try it. Anything you learn is going to be extremely valuable, but it is helpful to have some tools at your disposal to like, oh, maybe I should try starting at this point or maybe it, like when I run into a roadblock which will inevitably happen including on this project like what's what how do I get myself out of that so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Woo so we'll also have some discussion throughout or you'll you'll be pausing to talk us through your process beautiful and folks can ask questions or maybe chat questions to you if they have them yes sounds wonderful Feel free to chat or reach out in any way you want. Are we recording or should I record? We are recording. Um, so everyone just be mindful of that. Um, I have the option of spotlighting Patricia so that you'll, she'll be predominantly who we see. Uh, but if you have a request not to be seen, it looks like a lot of folks aren't sharing video anyways. Um, you can chat that to me. And I want to plug also, I'm, I'm pulling it up right now, your Venmo in the account so that folks can, can donate funds to you for sharing your work with us and uh, making this space to be here. So I'll plug that into the chat and just get started whenever you feel ready. Amazing. Let's jump right in. Thank you so much, Drew, for all your work and for introducing me. I'm so grateful to Flux Factory. Never done anything like this before. I'm a tiny bit scared, but... It's gonna be good and we're gonna learn. You got this. Leo, our cat, is like lying in the middle of the fabric. Which he loves to do. <laughs> I cannot do a single sewing project without Leo lying on all the most important pieces. So we'll oh. there he is. Oh, so cute. He's stretching. He's like, wow, love it. Love it. Still the fabric. Um right, so Okay, I'm gonna go on mute. Okay, great. So even starting with fabrics, like of course, being in New York, we have the fashion district, we have like the fabrics, um, stores like all on, all in Midtown, basically. Um, I do a lot of fabric shopping online. I actually, like, I struggle sometimes to find fabrics I really like, even in stores. They are, like, fabric is expensive, which makes sense. It's expensive to produce. Um, but I think also nowadays, because there's so many fewer like home sewers, a lot of fabrics are geared towards quilters and cosplayers, which is not always like, which like these are extremely talented sewists who like spend a lot of their time and money on sewing. They're the biggest demographic probably um, of home sewers. So I think a lot of like home sewing fabrics are marketed towards or geared towards those demographics, which is not always like my favorite way to make clothes like the fabrics are just kind of different quilting you use cotton typically like just simple cotton which is a great place to start um but i buy a lot of fabric online like vintage fabrics on ebay i love rayons and cottons um sometimes polyesters and this fabric is from fab scrap which is like this fabric reclamation project in new york they have an online store but you can also volunteer and get fabric from them um, I'm using a silk. So because I sew from patterns, um, there's fabric suggestions on the pattern. Um, so here's like the totally torn up little envelope because it's like 50 something years old, but it'll say on the back suggested fabric types for like both the underdress, which is the like primary part of the dress I'm going to start with and the overdress, which is the netting on top. So there's like rayons, taffetas, satin. So this is silk satin that I got. Um, silk is usually hard to sew with because it's so slippery, but it's also so strong. Um, I typically don't sew with it, so that's kind of going to be an adventure, but I'm excited. Um, so getting started, um, you're going to start with this pattern. The back has sizing information. So um, modern patterns are a little bit different because patterns will come multi-sized. So instead of just having a pattern piece like this one with a single size on it, this one's a size 12, they'll come with multiple sizes. So it'll be like a 12, a 10, and an 8. Um, and that way you can actually cut. It's First of all, it's cheaper for the companies because you just have to print like one piece and like provide more variation. But also you can cut to size, like if you're grading a pattern up or down. 
Um, but on the back, you'll see the straight size um, pattern measurements and fabric suggestions. It looks like this, but you're going to look at the standard body measurements. And what's important is that what you're looking for is your own bust measurement, like not the size that the dress is going to end up being, but what your bust is because clothes are designed with what's called ease in mind and ease is like the extra stretch or the extra space in the fabric that you need in order to like move around in a piece of clothing. Like not all clothing is going to be designed like tight to the body. This dress is a great example because it's tight to the waist and to the bust. But of course there's tons of ease built into the skirt because it's like a huge puffed out skirt. So even though the size 12 is for like a 32 bust, a 25 waist and a 34 hip, which is like a very kind of like standard sample size. Um, there's going to be ease in the waist and in the hip because like people move, you sit down, you like move around and because the waist is so free and large. So that's like not really what's important. Um, that's something to look out for and that the body measurement you're looking for is starting at if you're making a dress or a top, you want to measure to the bust. And if you're making pants or a skirt, you want to measure to the waist. That's going to get you the most accurate. And then you can grade according to that. This is not going to be a grading workshop. It's just too much information, but um, there's amazing videos and resources on YouTube. If you want to actually start seriously grading patterns up or down based on how your body varies from the standard body measurements because everyone's does. Um, but let's get started. So this is a size 12 pattern. I have the size 12 only because like I bought this pattern vintage because I liked how it looked and then like never really had plans of making it but was interested in it. So like sizing didn't really matter to me. Of course, vintage sizing and clothing pattern sizing is totally different um, from what we now expect it to be. Uh, vintage size 12 is, as I mentioned, a 32 bust and a 25 waist. So that is like smaller than probably what we would expect, but you're going to get the instructions and this has a layout of exactly how to lay out your pattern when you're starting to cut it. So um, when we look at this, like you want to look at view one, that's the dress I picked out and it has like little pictures of exactly how the pattern is supposed to be laid out on the dress, like on the fabric um with the exact pattern piece like value so there this initial pattern uses pieces a b f h k l not a lot of pieces one of them is very large because it's the like main part of the skirt of the dress um so what i always do is i lay it out on this like double thickness pattern um so like my fabric is folded the selvages, which are the like woven edges of the fabric are put together and then basically you just have to copy the picture. It's important to read the instructions. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try and get Leo out of here and then see if we can start laying pattern pieces. Okay. Um, let's get started. Well, okay, he's... Um, if anyone wants to chat about, oh my God, he's such a little brat. Um, let's see. <laughs> of course, like gets off the pattern, gets off the fabric and lays directly on the pattern piece. Like so helpful, thank you. Um, I want to kind of maybe talk about like, what do we think about when we're purchasing clothing? What do we think about is the most important thing and like what guides like, our clothing choices because like everyone wears clothing, everyone engages in fashion in some way um, just by merit of that and like by merit of our own personal taste as people like moving through the world. So talk to me about that if anyone has thoughts. I'm very interested to hear. Let's see if I can. Just Shout them out. <laughs> I'm literally just going to be laying out pattern pieces, so it might be a little dry for a second here. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, just when you're choosing clothing or when you're choosing even what to put on in the morning, like what's important to you um, when you're making a purchase, when you're even getting dressed, like what are the things you think about? What's your personal relationship to 
um, like consuming clothing, whether that's putting it on or whether that's purchasing it or mm -hmm. anything, you know, like it is a form of like um, communicating with the world, whether that's communicating with how you spend your um, income or whether that's communicating with how you present yourself when you're out and about. Um, I can like start to answer that. Um, I look for comfort and indestructibility. Um, wow, indestructibility. Yeah, if it's like fragile in any way or like easily stained or like wrinkles really easily, then I can't deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> Just won't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because Why? I'm curious. Because as I, I, I live a active lifestyle. Yeah. And I need to be able to like sit down comfortably and not have things like cut into me and. Wow. Why? Wait, did you ask why? Yeah, no, I think you, you started to answer it, but there might have been a little pick up, but like. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I just, I just need to like be able to be in multiple different like positions like throughout the day and feel like everything moves the right way. Do you think you're well served by the clothes that you like find? I think that, um, yeah, I like to research a lot. Like yeah. before I buy something, um, like something new. And I think that I'm well served by the things that I research. Um, I need more color in my life, but other than that, yeah. Not to put anyone on the spot, but Jenny has been dying her own clothes, like thrifting things. And then um, I know Jenny was here at one point. Oh, cool, I wanna learn about that. Jennifer. Um, yeah which is really cool. That's like a really fun and like not super difficult way to kind of like jump into any kind of clothing modification. It's just like dying things. Thank you for the shout out, Patricia. <laughs> <laughs> just gonna put you on the spot real quick. <laughs> um, Jenny, do you have any thoughts about your, your dying process? Um, I mean, it's just a fun way to experiment and like a fun way to take something that you're bored of and like rather than get rid of clothing, try to like, you know, make it something new and something you're excited about. And I feel like it's a good way to engage with in trends without being wasteful, you know, because you can take something and dye it like a trendy color, like chartreuse or something, but <laughs> uh, not you know, it's still something that was already in your closet. So it's, yeah, it's been fun. And it never really comes out how I expect <laughs> is the main <laughs> thing I would say. I have a yeah. question. C can you only dye white things or can you dye like other things? Um, no, you, there's pretty good uh, like color removers. RIT, the brand RIT, R-I-T makes something called color remover and you can get like I mean, this works best on cotton, silk, and wool. It works best on natural fibers, but you can take um, the color out of something you already have and then dye it. It, it usually works well if you're gonna, you know, take something that's like a, a bright color or a light color and then dye it darker. Um, I don't know, like, I don't think you could take something that's black and then dye it, remove all the color and then dye it pastel, but um, you can get, pretty good results with removing the color and then dyeing it something else. And you can also, one of the coolest things I did was make dye with avocado pits. If you boil avocado pits, it makes like a pink dye. Um, so that's really fun. I wanna do more like natural dyes. I love what you said about it never turning out how you want it to either. Like that is such a big part of like learning to sew and learning to sew with patterns is just recognizing that like first of all it's never going to look like the picture it's an illustration like it's never going to look like that but i think when i started i was always like wow it's going to look just like the picture and that's how i'm going to look when it's done which is like kind of funny it's like i got sold by the advertising on the pattern um but also just part of the process is like things will look different on the body things are going to look different on you like everything's constantly in flux so
Um, but for anyone else, um, I loved your answer about durability. Like, tell me, does anyone else have thoughts relating to this about how like clothes get lived in or again, back to the question of how you consume or present yourself in clothing? I'm like out of the frame, I think just crawling around paying stuff down. Jamie, I think what you said about like, like my kind of threshold for wearing, like my basically for clothing, I have to be able to sleep in it comfortably for it to be in my wardrobe, which I think is similarly to like having an active flash. Like I just want to be comfortable. So I, bas I haven't worn jeans since I was like in probably a decade, like since I was a teenager, because I just think they're so uncomfortable. Like anything um, with zippers, I don't usually like things with buttons I don't really like like right now I'm like pretty much you know in like a silk long like kimono type thing because it's just super comfortable um but I think I I you know I think maybe when I was younger I used to you know I used to wear like a lot of jewelry I used to wear like be more experimental with my clothing I guess but it would also be like as soon as I got home I would take off layers because it was too much or it was uncomfortable and I've kind of deviated. I basically just want to feel like naked all the time or <laughs> super comfortable in my clothing. Um, so yeah, what you're saying about, I don't know, what you're saying about your approach to clothing kind of resonated in that way for me. The naked thing is so funny because I've heard that like several times lately, especially when I talk about like sustainable clothing and I'm like, it feels like such a losing battle because even if you're buying sustainably, like, or even if you're buying like the most expensive clothing you can, like, which like we think of maybe as like more fair labor practices and protections, like you still, it's such a losing game because you don't know what the whole process looks like. And like so many of the responses I get when I talk about this are like, well, you know what, we should just be naked. Like, let's just give up the whole endeavor. <laughs> Love it. And now, like, in quarantine, like, you kind of can be. <laughs> that's so true. Um, and I think that's a really good point, too, to question what sustainability really means. And I think that's with, like, food, with clothing, everything. If we see that label of fair trade or sustainability, it's like, what does that actually mean? Was the whole process done in an ethical way? And also, what, like, yeah. There's just like to make clothing, there's so many different um, materials involved from the thread to the fabrics, like so many different elements. And was every step of that done in a way that's fair? And how, how do we define that? Yeah, 100%. And like, you know, and like is another, is another brand that's like mod, like nominally more sustainable, whatever that means than the last, like is that really gonna save us? Is that going to be the answer to the like incredible pollution that fabric causes? Um, I call it no. <laughs> I think one thing that I think what did you say? I didn't hear you. Oh, just that like, oh, are we like, is this incremental change? Sorry, I'm cutting out like a little piece right now. I'm cutting out midriff back. Yeah, I can't see. Sorry, I'm cutting out midriff back. So mm -hmm. I put the computer on the floor. Let's see. Um, I'm cutting out midriff back H right now, which is just a small piece that goes on this part of the fabric. The only reason that normally I like to like lay everything out and then cut and then mark, um, that is like the most time effective way. But I actually need four of these little pieces. So the fabric is doubled up right now. So there's two pieces right here. Um, and I need to cut four of them. So I'm just going to cut this one and then lay it out again. And the, like, but I have to make the fabric markings. So you wanna lay your fabric out upside down. So like wrong side out, um, because you have to make markings on the fabric in accordance to the markings on here. Fabric, putting together a pattern is kind of like putting together a little puzzle um, with instructions, but this like, four double notch, you're gonna like draw these two little notches onto this part of the fabric. And then later, once you're connecting midriff back to probably like bodice back or skirt back, what you're gonna do is connect this little double notch four to wherever the next little double notch four is. 
Um, so that's why you need to make the little pattern markings. Um, that's what I'm doing right now. I, do I, have, a I have a question. Please. Um, oh, so how are you just like tracing it? Like you're seeing the marking through, through the fabric? I'm, yeah, so the marking is on this little piece of tissue paper that like comprises the pattern. Mm -hmm. Um, so a pattern is just like an envelope that's filled with these little pieces of tissue that are marked with the name of the pattern piece and it's like letter. So for the underdress, for dress one, I need like letters A, B, H, K, and L. Um, so this one's H, it's midriff back. Um, so that's where I know it'll go. Each piece has a seam line and a cutting line. So you want to cut on the outer cutting line, which is the darker line or like the outside line. And then the seam line will show you like along which line you're going to be sewing. So like when you're connecting this piece to like upper bodice back, um, it needs to be connected like along this seam line. Usually seam lines on vintage patterns and on many like kind of standard um, modern patterns, it's five eighths of an inch, which kind of makes no sense, but it, like it, it's slowly been modernized to half an inch. But basically like normally that line will be on the sewing machine just because it is so standard. My sewing machine has a five eighths inch line so I can follow that along. Otherwise you kind of just get a sense for where it is. So like I have this piece, I'm going to make these markings of like small dots and little like zig, uh, I guess they're little, like they're little carrots. Um, make those markings so that I know how to connect it to the rest of the pieces. Um, some other pieces will have like dart markings and stuff like that, which is like you're going to be sewing into the fabric that you also have to draw. So basically you're just going to look and you're just going to copy all the markings from this pattern piece onto the like onto the fabric that you've cut out to be this size. Um, yeah, okay. So you just lift the paper. Yeah, I'll just lift the paper. Um, it's possible to also like cut through the paper. I usually don't do that with like vintage patterns or patterns that I want to use more than once. Um, thank you, mom. Um, other people will also like when you see this carrot, they will actually make a cut in the fabric so that it doesn't ever like fade away. This is a washable fabric marker. You can also use a pencil, a white pencil. People even use color pencils. Um, it's the wrong side of the fabric. It's gonna be on the inside anyway, so you don't have to be super precious with it. Um, but yeah, you just wanna copy all of the pattern markings from this pattern piece onto the fabric on both sides. Um, Anyways, what were we talking about? Sustainability, clothes. Um, one thing I've also been thinking about is like the worth, something that I guess I kind of touched on a little bit when I first started, first started talking was like the worth of clothes and like how much clothing like quote unquote should cost like as we're democratizing fashion and all this. Um, people are like, this clothes costs too much. You're like, why does clothing cost so much? Why does clothing cost so little? Like these are all very valid questions. Um, but like, it's true that the cost of clothing actually seems like completely divorced from the labor that went into it. Like how can we, how can two coats, one of them from Zara and one of them from Prada, one of them costs like, $200 and one of them, or not even, one of them costs $20 and one of them costs like $2,000. Like, how does that make sense? How can we even like reckon with that? Um, I don't really have an answer to that, but like when I think about sewing, that does help me figure out at least if not the true cost of clothing, because it's not like I'm producing the fabric or producing the pattern, which is labor, but like at least this way I'm thinking about like how much it's worth it for me to spend eight hours on a coat or like how much it's worth it for me to like, you know, have the skills and like the knowledge of how to like source a pattern and source fabric and then put together that coat. Like that is what's really been valuable to me is like, what does worth even mean? Well, like worth is supposed to be connected to labor. It's obviously not, but like, at least this way I can like make sense of it for myself. 
kind of left that one left that one open ended for the audience, but um, that's what I think about a lot. Also, what I think about this is kind of related is like knockoffs, which have like recently turned into like the holy grail of like fashion don'ts. Is like if you knock something off. If you're a designer, if you knock something off, if you're a small designer and you get knocked off, like that is like the cardinal sin of fashion. There's like Diet Prada and everything. And it's just like, everyone's on the hunt for knockoffs, but it's like, there's a limited, like fashion still has to be worn. We've talked about, um, we've talked about like how we look for comfort. We look for wearability, things we can actually live in. So here's the second Mandra page. I'm going to do the exact same process on it. Um, I'm using the little like pattern picture, which tells me. Can I ask a question? Paper. Sorry. Yes. Please ask. Maybe you already covered this, but what exactly is this piece that you're cutting out? Yeah, um, I know what it is only because it says on here. So like you just have to like take the pattern out of its word, I guess. Um, but it's midriff back. So what that, that mean? mean? So Sorry. that means like, no, go ahead. No, of course. It's a really good question. Um, so because this dress is composed of three parts, you can think of it as like the bodice, the midriff, and the skirt. So like looking at the picture, things will be called different things. And like, especially because this is a 50s pattern, like sometimes like words go out of style or like fall out of use. But normally this is called a bodice, this is called the midriff, and then this is called the skirt and then the overskirt. So midriff here refers to her like midsection and that'll be like the back of it. Um, and so you need like a set of pieces to make up the back of her like dress bodice. So if you look at the tiny picture on the back illustration, like it's, it's the midsection back. You can see the seaming, it's like drawn in there, mm -hmm. but like that's what midriff back technically is. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, yeah, so that's a good question. And it's just like the series of pattern pieces. I think this is also something that comes with practice is you just like start recognizing the patterns of like, oh, like this piece is going to serve this purpose. But also like, honestly, what I would always do, um, which is probably also why I had so many like insane failed projects um, was I would just jump in. I'd be like, okay, picture says to do this. I'm just going to follow the picture. Um, and like, if you just take the instructions very much like step by step and don't get too like concerned about it and just kind of follow along. Things will fall into place one way or another. Um, <laughs> but it, it is helpful to know exactly what you're doing, like when you're doing it. And so yes, this is the back, like center back portion, I guess I would call it. So I'm flipping it over. I'm doing the other side. I'm actually surprised. Oops. I'm surprised they're having me cut out technically four of these. Um, maybe it's for the overdress or maybe like I'm just confused by how they've done the pattern illustration. Um, but I have tons of extra fabric because of how wide this fabric is. So I'm just going to follow along and hope for the best. Great. Section H is done. Um, I'm super not like a purist about what supplies to use. This one's really helpful because there's a water soluble side and an air and water soluble side on this like pattern pattern pen. It's like fabric pen. Um, I prefer to usually use the water soluble side because even though sometimes it doesn't wash out, which is a little bit iffy, like it'll come back in the cold or whatever. Um, like this allows me to spend multiple days on a project and not worry that all the pattern markings will disappear overnight. Um, so that's just kind of, but like, of course, as I said, you can use a pencil, you can use like whatever you want. It really doesn't matter. My suggestion is always to just jump right in. If you, if something goes terribly wrong, it will be valuable knowledge for the next time you do this. Um, I've cut out that piece. The next thing I'm going to start cutting out is like this huge piece labeled L, which is the skirt. So I actually need three of these big pieces and each of them is like doubled up so it's going to be like oh I need five of these pieces so two of them are doubled up and two of them are sing and one of them is a single so I'm going to end up with five of this like L pattern piece of the skirt because it's a really big skirt and it's they're just all big rectangles 
I'm going to do my best to make this pattern like available after the workshop. My initial goal was like, okay, I'm going to have this all available before the workshop. Everyone can follow along. I think that was like kind of a pipe dream of mine. It's like not really going to work out that way. And it's like a lot of talking and figuring out other people's patterns all at the same time. Um, but it's like a, it's a cool pattern. And like, I think there's interesting things to be learned from it. And of course it's like, it's a piece of history, right? Like it's from the fifties. So. Yeah, I have a question. Please. What, what year is this pattern from? Do, does it tell you? Um, the pattern pieces usually, usually don't tell you, although sometimes they'll have a copyright, but people who are really into patterns, um, there's like this huge wiki of like vintage patterns. Um, I think if you just, yeah, look, yeah. That's what I was say. yeah, so that's, people get confused about that because it seems like it's a resource for like free patterns. It's not patterns are like not digitized and available for free usually especially vintage ones because as you can see it's actually huge pieces that are like made to size um mm -hmm. so it's actually just like kind of a wikipedia resource about the pattern um and about like uh sometimes they have like links to people who are selling it sometimes they have links to people who have made it and like their blogs which is yeah. cool um but like it will also have information about the pattern like the year. Um, so this is a 1956 pattern. Um, I think, so like when I started sewing, I like from patterns, I was using modern patterns from like what's called the big four, which is Butterick, McCall's, Simplicity, um, Vogue patterns, and Butterick, McCall's, Simplicity, Vogue. Yeah, that's the four. That's, yeah, that's me coming for. Um, and modern, and so they're really, really accessible, which is awesome. Like they're definitely geared towards like a modern home sewer who wants to make like kind of maybe a more capsule wardrobe. They do have some adventurous stuff sometimes, sometimes. Um, and like, just like practical, simple, and usually very easy to make things because like most people who are starting sewing from patterns, like that is the level they're at. Like, they want um, easy to follow patterns with like really clear instructions, which is really awesome. I have a couple problems with them. Um, one is the patterns are usually cut with like way too much ease. It's like kind of like a vanity, vanity sizing issue of like, if you're choosing this size, you're actually gonna get like two or three sizes bigger, which like that, I don't know why they do it. It's, it's really unhelpful. Um, it's they're just like maybe more sloppily designed in some instances there's amazing like indie pattern makers i took a class with a woman named anika truman with my mom um, and she makes her own patterns and she also has like youtube tutorial follow alongs which are really awesome so you can kind of like learn at every step so there's mm -hmm. really awesome like kind of small indie pattern maker shops that make really beautiful patterns um i have a question yeah, go ahead. Um, what was the wiki that you um, were talking about? And also, um, can you put these uh, resources somehow in the chat at some point? Like, um, I'd love to see these indie patterns you're talking about. Yes, totally. What was that pattern brand, Patricia? Uh, so the woman who I took the class from, and she's just an example. There's like tons of really awesome um, kind of smaller designers, but her name is Anita Truman. I think my mom can even put it in the chat, mom, if you want to send it. But it's Anita. A N E K A. Cool. Truman, T R U M A N, like Truman Capote. Um, so she has like this very accessible way of like, she releases a pattern and then she releases all of the steps that you need to follow it like in youtube tutorials and in photo form so like there's really um amazing ways to kind of like self self teach yourself how to sew um and like as for my preference like usually i work from vintage patterns i like collecting them i think that sometimes because the expectation like from maybe like 
the 40s through the 70s was that people were able to sew. You get kind of more complex and interesting techniques. Like this dress has like boning in it. So it has like elements of corsetry in it that like you don't usually see unless you're specifically buying like corsetry patterns. Um, so stuff like that. Are you cutting off the edge of your pattern? Someone yeah. can ask, are you, are you, do you this one I'm cutting off. So I'm still cutting to the, I hope you can see this. I'm cutting to the cutting line, um, but because the piece is so big here. So I'm cutting it down to the cutting line, like the dark black, like outer. Oh, I see. But because this piece took up, took up the whole page, like I just, I just um, tacked it down with the like excess on and I'm cutting the excess along with this silk. Like normally I wouldn't do that. I would cut paper and fabric separately, especially because I have nice scissors. Thank you to my mom who got them for me. But um, like this, like, yeah, I know she's, she's truly been my guardian angel and so I've been learning how to sew. But um, because silk is such like a hard fabric anyways, I kind of want to get them sharpened after I finish this project. And this fabric, like the, it's tissue paper, it's not paper. But having separate scissors for fabric and for paper is like a really good idea. And that's the one thing I would like splurge on. It just makes your life so much easier. Yeah, I know a lot of people who do that. Yeah, I remember like growing up, my mom would yell at me if I used like fabric scissors for like cutting random paper, or, like doing it for like using them for school projects or something. Yep. Like, <laughs> but um, Patricia, I, I had a question. Um, is it possible to like, make patterns um from like by like taking apart clothes you own like if I had something that I owned that I wanted to like remake in a different fabric or remake like somehow slightly differently does like taking apart clothes work very well to like remake them yes um 100 you can do that um what I love about working from patterns at least for a little while is you're able to kind of get a sense of like certain scenes like darts and stuff that aren't as obvious as like, oh, the sleeves are attached in this way. Um, and then also like, if you kind of know what you're already doing, putting together clothes, you're able to do it without maybe cutting apart the original. Um, but that's an amazing way to remake clothes. You can do it without cutting apart the original if you're just very mindful of all of the pieces and lay them flat. Um, uh, trace them onto pattern paper, like anything you want. Um, you can buy blank fabric paper, like from sewing stores off Amazon, stuff like that from Etsy. Um, and you can also just like lay it out and kind of trace it. Yeah, it's completely doable. That's like a, also a really amazing way to like recreate historical clothing, like antiques and stuff like that, that maybe you don't want to wear. So yeah, it's very doable. And it's a like an amazing way to learn how to sew. So maybe not, maybe not like for your first project, maybe after you like have a better idea of just like the fundamentals of fabric coming together. Yeah, that, yeah, especially if it's maybe th something that has like multiple small pieces but it's also like, honestly, I'm a huge proponent of just like, try it, see what happens and like, see what you can learn. Um, like after the first attempt, like it's just gonna be a valuable learning experience no matter what happens at the end. Um, you can reach out to me at any time if you have like any questions and I will do my best to see what I can tell you. But um, yes, it's like a very, it's a great way to learn how to sew and learn how clothes are put together. Is it that how you do all your sorts? Yeah, I, I have done that several times um, to make shorts and stuff. I'll usually use it in like confluence with an existing pattern. I'm now marking this first skirt piece. I'll do it in confluence with like an existing pattern. So like that will kind of sometimes fill in the blanks for me. If I'm like, okay, I know I want to like, if I'm like, okay, I know I want to make these, these shorts to like have a cut of an existing short, but like, um, I also have a pattern to show me how a pocket comes together or something like that. So like having, uh, I'm like crawling around. Um, having like your pattern pieces, but also your existing clothes work together like that is also a really great way to do it.
Let's see. Okay. So I have this skirt. I have the first two skirt pieces cut and I've made, they only have two markings because it's just like the two sides that come together. Um, so I'm going to lay out another skirt piece. Yes, that's my next move. I'm just taking all the pins out and I'm going to set the fabric pieces aside. So you are not doing any markings on that piece? It only has two markings on it actually. It only has one little notch on either side. It also has a gathering line along the top, but like you don't need to mark that because it's just, you're just sewing like part, you're just sewing um, along the top basically to create a gather, but we can talk about that once we get into the sewing phase. Let's see. So does any, does anyone have like um, existing, like have you worked from a pattern before? Have you like, do you have any, um, experience with this? So if you buy any of these like modern, uh, modern patterns that has like a million sizes on the one page. Yeah. Like, do you cut the pattern into pieces or do you try to trace your size? Um, so usually what I'll do is like, I mean, for one, what's really nice about modern patterns that have many sizes on one piece is if you're in between sizes, so like say if you're like a size six bust, a size eight waist and a size eight hip or like anything like that, you can actually trace between the sizes. So you don't have to like be stuck to like this one size, like this only has one size on it. If there's multiple sizes within a pattern piece, you can cut between the sizes. Like if you have like a larger like waist piece, you can cut a larger bust, a smaller waist and like trim between the patterns. I will usually, especially if it's just like, if it's a modern pattern that I bought at a sewing store or that I like downloaded online, um, I will just like cut, I'll just cut it out. Like I don't need to like preserve it or save it. Um, some people are very precious, especially with like their vintage patterns. Um, unfortunately for these vintage patterns, I'm not that precious with them. I kind of just want to use them and like learn from them. But um, I think it's fine to just cut and not trace, to be honest. Yeah. Everyone has their own philosophy. Some people are a lot more archival about it, which I respect that. It's just something that I like. It's just not my interest. Good for them. Good for them. Um, most of the time I'll buy my patterns off of this Facebook group that I'm in called Vintage Sewing Patterns Auction Parlor where like women who have spent their like whole lives collecting patterns will like post the patterns they want to sell and then you bid on it just by like making a Facebook comment which is kind of funny and like old school and it's just like people on Facebook who want to sell patterns um and like there'll be bidding wars over ones that people really like and stuff like that um but it's a fun way to get to see a variety of patterns it's kind of hard to like find patterns that you really like on eBay or Etsy I've found just because patterns are sold by number. I mean, like this pattern is called Simplicity 2231. Like I wouldn't be able to necessarily always find it searching like wedding dress because that's not what everyone's going to label it as. Um, they're gonna call it Simplicity 2231 and then maybe some descriptive words. Sorry, um, question. Where's the place where you can find the patterns with the bidding wars? Yeah, it's called Vintage Sewing Patterns Auction Parlor Kiss Emoji. <laughs> what emoji? It's like a kissing face emoji. It's a kissing mouth. It's like the lipstick print emoji. Vintage Sewing Patterns Auction Parlor. And it's a Facebook group that you have to request to join, but it's um, a valuable, amazing resource. It's so funny. Yeah, it's, it's seriously just like helpful, helpful middle-aged women who love collecting and selling patterns. Um, but I will often just scroll through there and like save images of patterns I like and then look them up later because it's still an extremely useful resource. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, you take what you want out of it, but it's a very supportive group, really awesome. It has like sister groups where you can ask for advice. Um, but yeah, Facebook has been a, an amazingly useful source of pattern information. Um, but like thrift stores will also have patterns. They'll have like pattern bins, which is really cool that you can kind of just like dig through. Um, there's a variety of sources for like anything you can think of. And of course, like you can just search like wedding dress pattern. You can just search like jacket, you know, and you'll get stuff. And like, um, like it's, it is, it's, it's still really easy to find. Um, I would never discourage that. It's just that this is such like this auction group on Facebook is such a fun way for me to kind of get to like see a great variety that I might not have, you know, stumbled across before. Um, and of course, like scrolling through the vintage patterns wiki, like absolutely anything. I just really think that like any mode of exploration that gets you excited about sewing and patterns is going to be a good one. I'm cutting out the second skirt piece. Uh, um, so this is pieces number three and four of five. So actually, after I finish cutting this one out, I'm gonna cut out one more on a single flat lay fabric. So like these are all doubled up. There, it's like two layers of fabric, um, and then I have one more to go on a single layer of fabric, and then cutting the other pattern pieces out. I love the sound of your scissors as you go around. Oh, thank you. It's very like, nice A ASMR. Yeah, sewing ASMR. Yeah. So I think it could work. I, one first thing that I taught Patricia, she's much more talented than I am, but I taught her that don't ever use your scissors that you're cutting, like your fabric scissors, don't ever use them on paper because you're going to ruin them in one cut. So, so you have to have separate right. paper cutters cutting scissors and good scissors actually are super expensive yeah like you can get cheap fabrics you can get really cheap patterns like you can get five cent patterns at a store you can get cheap fabric on ebay or from like scraps and stuff like that like it's not hard to find a lot of the materials but like scissors i would say definitely worth like splurging on there's of course there's always more you can do like some people use rotary cutters and stuff like that. So they don't even have to like do the cut. They can just like go around. Some people also don't even pin, they have pattern weights. So they just kind of like put a weight on the pattern. And in some cases that's even like a better idea than pinning because you're not damaging the fabric at all. Um, but like, honestly, like you don't need fancy anything. Like you just like, if you just want to do it and you want to try things and you have a sewing machine, like just go for it. And I like that you said you were probably gonna take your scissors to be sharpened after this. I think that upkeep definitely goes a long way also. Yeah, yeah. I wanna like keep my, I mean, just like I wanna keep clothes that I need forever and I wanna keep clothes forever. Like I wanna keep my tools, you know, and I don't, it's not disposable. Absolutely. Um. That's actually interesting is like the idea of like disposable fashion and like, I mean, everyone is sick of how fast the fashion cycle runs um, and how like there's like, I mean, when you're talking about high fashion, there's anywhere between like four and like seven shows a year, which seems ridiculous. That's just too much new clothing, but also just the disposable nature of clothing. Like I want to hear about how often, you know, like what happens to your clothes when you're done with them? Like, I don't know. Maybe that's like a leading question. Maybe I'm like, I don't want to seem like I'm like shaming anyone. I don't want to hear like, oh, I'm going to keep all my clothes until they wear out and then fix them. But Sarah actually, this is, I don't know if Sarah is still here, but Sarah like makes canvases out of discarded. I'm here. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> canvases out of discarded clothing. So maybe you can talk about that. Um, sure. So um, for 
my paintings, I take old clothes and I deconstruct them and then I re-sew them and then I use that and then I stretch them on stretcher bars and I use that as like the basis for um, making paintings. Oh, that sounds beautiful. It's really cool. I have a Sarah painting hanging right above me as I sew. Another thing is, is like when I was first, when I was first sewing up, what I was doing was like mending people's jeans. So like when you get that hole in the like crotch area from like walking around too much in your jeans, um, like my whole thing was I loved like mending that. I still find it extremely satisfying. I love doing that. That's like what really got me into everything. Um, but what I would use to like mend them is that I would, um, I would use old jeans that had been totally destroyed from like thrift stores and stuff like that, that were like completely unusable. And then I would use those as the patches for um, like fixing people's jeans that they wanted to keep wearing. So clothes helping each other, give each other a new little lease on life. Which I think is interesting. And of course, like people still like cut up shirts to use as rags and stuff like that. Like textiles are valuable. This is kind of interesting is like um, kind of before textiles were as cheap as they are now and like clothes were as cheap as they are now. This is a fact that will always blow my mind is that um, people used to individually will away parts of clothing like in their wills when they died um they would include like individual sleeves because fabric was so valuable wow and like also like people didn't own have they didn't own land they didn't i mean <laughs> you know like people still don't own land but um like individual clothing pieces were so valuable that like that would be part of what you're giving away when you die mm -hmm. Um, and this is like a hundred years ago. Like this is just like pre-industrial, I guess not industrial relation, but like pre, um, like Fordism, I guess. So before clothes were all like easily accessible and um, cheap to me. Victorian era. Um, that also leads into like why we think that people used to be smaller like a hundred years ago. Like why, here, let me tilt this again. Like why there's this conception of, let's do a time check. Oh, cool. Um, why is there this conception of like, oh, people used to be so much smaller. People used to be so much like quote unquote thinner because all the clothes we see in museums or the, all the vintage clothes we find are so tiny. Um, and the reason for that is not because people actually used to be smaller, like people in terms of their actual size haven't changed that much. Um, like it's, it's really marginal and like, to be frank, like fat people have always existed. Um, it's not like you can't have this rewriting of history that like everyone used to be so tiny. Like that's really not true. It's just that fabric was reused and reused like until it was completely threadbare and down to like the tiny scraps which were then turned into quilts um and like used in that way so like textiles used to be so much more valuable that they had to be used and reused and so the ones that survive are going to be tiny things that weren't like as useful um wealthy people's things because they didn't need to like cut them down into different things they could just have a dress that they could keep um or like really sentimental things like wedding dresses um so like that's an interesting like survivorship bias issue that like actually hurts people because like it totally removes historical nuance from like oh how do we think people used to live and how do we think these people used to be and what does how does that affect our values now but like clothing is part of that story, but I think there's this loss of nuance that comes with that. Kind of a digression. 
But there you go. Okay, I have this laid out. This is the last skirt piece that I'm going to cut out. Yay. Um, and then there's just a few more pieces for the underdress. And that's what I'm going to do today. Um, but vintage is a big thing right now. Can, does anyone have thoughts on like the current like vintage economy or how we engage with vintage clothing or like how you personally like engage with vintage clothing, like what you prefer when you buy vintage or if you buy vintage, like does anyone have thoughts here? Um, personally, I love buying vintage. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, it's okay. Um, I'll, I'll go after you. I was just saying I love buying vintage to, to watch for the quality difference. Yeah. Um, uh, some stuff like 50 years ago, even, um, and much older, obviously too, is, is you can see hand stitching in, in those garments if you come across them, which I think is pretty neat. Yeah, that's so true. And like, that's from like people modifying garments because they want to keep wearing them or because they want to give them to someone else who needs to wear it differently. You know, like, even if it's initially machine made, like it still has this story associated with it because people want to keep using it or painting it down. Um, something that, that I like to do is like, if I see something online, um, maybe even or like from that's like a newer brand or even like fast fashion, but I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm interested in like how this looks. Like I'll look up like on like Etsy through like, um, through like, they have like a lot of filters. You can just like pick vintage and then like, I'll, I'll type in like a vague description of like the thing that I saw and I'll, I'm able to find like something like very similar to that, but in like more, in a more sustainable way. Yeah, I love that. I had an art history teacher who he would always like pull up a new art piece that he wanted to talk about and then he'd be like nothing new under the sun and he would like laugh to himself <laughs> for the longest time he'd be like ah <laughs> said it again <laughs> um but it's really true I mean modern brands use historical clothing and use historical patterns in order to come up with their collections um it's really awesome when like I saw like an Orsi and Iris post that like one brand that's always doing like little corsets and bustiers and stuff. They're like a pretty small brand. Um, and she had like, so the founder had posted like how she like used this um, vintage like costume piece and turned it into like part of her collection, like how she had modified it, which I thought was really awesome. Cause you will don't always get to see that. Um, and like, I've also spoken to, let's see if I can get cut. Um, I've spoken to this woman um, who, her name is Suzanne Fitzgen, and she ran this huge um, clothing rental service, which in which they would collect like meaningful vintage or meaningful um, like design, meaningfully, like interestingly designed clothing, and then rent it out to designers who would then like copy specific parts of that, like of the dress or whatever. Um, and that was her business. Like she would sell um, access to vintage clothing to designers so that they could see how things were made and then use it, which I think is really fascinating. Yay, okay, that's all the skirt pieces done. That was easy. And now hopefully we can get kind of a more zoomed in view now that I'm going to work on the like smaller pieces. I'm just going to mark this. Cool. Yay. Okay. So that's, that's the last skirt piece. There's five skirt pieces. It's gonna be a lot of sewing. Um, 
yeah has anyone ever like experimented with making their own clothes before or like modifying them like jenny does or like even like mending replacing a button you know those are all parts of sewing can anyone talk about they've done stuff like that i do that i also um i sew by hand oh my goodness you are so patient i haven't done anything like a full pattern by hand but i'm thinking about it um i made like 400 masks by hand oh my god first hit wow 400 that's amazing i think i kind of lost count i'm not sure how many but it was like somewhere in that range wow and, um i really like sewing by hand but um yeah it's like mending something's kind of a spiritual thing for me because it's it's just like making this one little thing right again that was not right or that was bugging me and it can really boost my confidence even if I'm just fixing a button yeah I love that that's amazing I'm like so impatient with hand sewing but I totally agree with you on mending it's like such a rewarding like practice to get to do that Yeah, I feel like it's cool because it deepens your relationship with that object now too, like no matter what store it came from or maybe it was a gift or something, but now you're, you have your handwork in it too. Yeah, Yun Ray was just talking about that the other day because his project for Nobody's Fashion Week is like a repeated washing process of his own clothing that will then like degrade them and then he's gonna like mend them. So he was just talking about that. I think it's really cool. Mm -hmm. I feel that too, and I've also, um, in the past, cut out tags. Um, like some tags I really love, especially if they're like a random brand, like magic or something. <laughs> but I feel like, you know, the words that we wear on our bodies are kind of like spells. So I try to only have like words that, that are special. Wow. Um, so I've been experimenting with like sewing, um, or I have in the past, I haven't done it in a while, but like sewing affirmations where wow. the name would be like powerful or like, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. I love that. That's amazing. That's so beautiful. Um, so my next, the next part of this process is um, cutting out like the last few pieces um which are let me just grab them so let's see so the last few pieces i've cut out all the skirt i cut out the um the the midriff back that we talked about and then there's three more pieces to um the underdress so you can see that it's actually not like the part that that's not the netting is actually pretty simple it's six pieces total because it's skirt, the midriff front, the midriff back, and then the bodice front and the bodice back, and then there's a little strap that's optional, like a little spaghetti strap. Um, these next ones, so like they get placed slightly differently on the fabric. Um, in this case, the selvages, which are the woven edges of the fabric, like if you've heard of like, oh, jean selvage, it's the fabric where you can see like that it was finished on either side. So if you have like seven yards of fabric like I do, you're gonna have four sides and two of them are like two sides of consistent length or the selvage. Um, so in this case, I folded it with the selvages together and then a fold on the far side. The reason why I'm doing this, it's how it's laid out like on view one of the pattern. Um, yeah, so I'm going to lay these out how they need to be laid out and cut. Yeah, so this pattern piece says center front place on fold. Um, this is the bodice. So I'm going to lay it so that it's touching the folds. That will make it so that I'm cutting out actually just one big piece, um, if that makes sense, because it's going to be like along this side of the fabric. Um, same with the midriff front, which will be like this lower part, like right here on the body. 
um, is also getting placed on the fold. And then the bodice back, because there's going to be a zipper, is just going to be placed like along the straight grain. It's going to have a separation, um, if that makes sense. So let's start cutting. Double checking, just double checking on the instructions that I'm doing everything right. Everything's fine. Um, so it is kind of a long, like somewhat like meditative process of having like all the fabric prepared and then you have to like lay and pin all these pieces and then mark them and um, just like there's a lot of preparation before you even get into the sewing. Um, sometimes I find it really boring. I'm like, I wish, wish I were just sewing already. I'm tired of just cutting these pieces, but it's, this is part of the process. It's valuable. Um, it's possible to do it without it if you're just like self-drafting or just like randomly cutting out pieces and sewing them together, which I think is legitimate. But um, like it just teaches, it just like gives you time to think about like how much time this actually takes. Um, obviously in like a factory setting, like right, like a, a real quote unquote, like a real sewing um, factory, like pieces are laser cut out or they're cut or like pieces are cut through like many, many layers of fabric. So instead of just cutting out like one bodice front piece, you're cutting out like a hundred at a time. It's just a different setting, but like at the end of the day, um, the actual sewing that happens to bring all these pieces together and like all of your clothing is made of pieces, um, it's done by hand. So like, even though like I'm definitely not working as quickly as like up to a professional standard, even if it's like, you know, a single seamstress working in a professional setting, like all of this still has to be done by a person. It's not, not a robot. It's not like a machine that just brings clothes together. Um, and I think that's like that merits thinking about. When you start sewing from a new pattern, do you, do you read all the instructions first before you even start like cutting or anything or do just the, like read as you go? Um, I will go over it. So like I will open up the, the, um, I'll open up the little booklet, which will just be like one or two like big instruction sheets with pictures. Like it just has pictures um, and like words to go along with it. <laughs> It'll have pictures and instructions. Um, and I will go over it to see if there's something I should expect or like kind of prepare for. Um, or if there's going to be something like totally new, like I know that this pattern has like corset boning in it, which I've never done. Um, but at the same time, like sometimes it is very overwhelming to just be like, oh my God, I have to do this. I have to do this. Like, I have no idea how I'm going to like do this step. And the answer is like, it's fine. You just have to get started and like follow along slowly when you get stuck. Like when I get stuck, I'll like look up a YouTube video be like, what are they actually talking about? Um, so I will look it over, um, especially if I'm just curious or if I want to know. Um, but at the end of the day, like you can't let it psych you out. You have to just like jump in and do it. Um, and like, I will look one step ahead. So if I'm working on like the bodice, I'll, I'll check the instructions to see like, okay, when should I anticipate like bringing the skirt together or like what pieces do I need to have prepared for the next couple steps? Um, but it's not, I don't know. It's, it's a very like one step at a time process. I think when I first started, I would like um, start sewing and then I would start looking ahead and ahead and I'd be like, oh my God, I've never sewn a pocket before. I cannot do this. Like, oh my God, I'm so bad at sewing collars. Like, this instruction is so confusing because like sometimes vintage instructions are very confusing. They use words that are not really in use anymore. Let me see if I can like. I found that even with modern patterns, it's much like that too. Like I'm like the first few patterns I ever used, I completely felt like they were just throwing in made up terms every now and then. It took me a really long time to read them. I remember 
yeah, it's, it can be very stressful. Like, I'm like, oh my goodness, like, how do they expect me to know all this? Um, but with just like patience, looking closely at illustrations, um, and like a little bit of YouTube video, like walkthrough in some steps, um, it does become more accessible. It's just about not like getting totally confused and like throwing everything at a wall. More just like, okay, I know how to do this. If not, I will learn. Yeah, over time, like I now feel more comfortable with a lot of the terms and stuff, but it's just a lot of technical learning you kind of have to figure out or wait to figure out at the beginning. Yeah, that's so true. And honestly, like the number of times that I've started a new pattern and been like, wow, I'm so grateful that the last pattern I did had this step because now I know exactly how to do it. Like, Absolutely. even if I'm totally confused and I know I'm messing something up and I have to like go back and seam rip something like four times, which has totally happened. Um, it's just so useful to like learn it once and the next time it's going to be so much easier. Totally. I was just, I was just working on this little jacket that I'm um, making right now. So kind of have a lot going on at the moment. Um, <laughs> I'm working on this little jacket and I sewed the collar and I finished it and I was like, wow, this used to be like the hardest thing ever for me. I could just not sew collars. Um, like every single time it would come out like wonky or like there'd be like, it would just look a mess. And I did it yesterday and I didn't even think about it. I was like, this is so easy. <laughs> so you learn. Um, That's so cool. yeah, I was really happy. I was like, this was, this was so easy. Um, I'm doing the bodice front now. I'm going to do the drawing on this. One thing that I think is kind of important to like, like notice here is darts. So darts are not challenging. It was just something that confused me at first. And they're on almost every piece of non-stretch women's clothing. So unless you're, um, and even some stretch, stretch fabrics will have them because darts are what gives shape to a garment. Like if you're wearing something that's completely flat on the front, like the curves of your body, it would be like wearing a piece of paper. It doesn't make sense. So you need to be like creating darts or like shapes in the fabric so that it conforms to your figure. Um, and that's not like, oh, we all need to be wearing like form fitting clothes, but it's more like fabric has to have shapes in it so that it's able to fit us correctly. Um, and like that's where stretch fabrics, like you don't see darts on stretch fabrics because the fabric will stretch to your body. But if you're wearing like more tailored clothing or like clothing that has a shape to it, like it will have darts in it. And so like knowing what a dart is and how to make one is also useful if you want to copy an existing piece of clothing um, because this is like gonna be a feature. Um, darts are even available, like they're present on shorts because normally people's waists are um, smaller than their hips. Um, darts are present on like the backs of clothing because otherwise look like your back has a natural curve to it. So darts look like this on patterns. They look like a little triangle cut out. Um, what you want to do is like make this dot here, make this dot here, make this dot here, and then trace the triangle with a little ruler um, or any kind of straight edge in order to create this. And we'll go over how to sew them um, tomorrow. What is the time lapse for? Wow, I think we're like really a time check. Did you see the time? It's twelve thirty-five. I'm if pretty you happy. Wanted to um, go ahead. No, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say if you wanted to, because we got started a few minutes late. If you wanted to keep this going until about one fifteen today, does that sound good? Sure, sure. I can also stick around be to 115 because honestly, I think like one is gonna be a pretty good stopping point because I'll have finished like doing the cutting on these um, and like the markings and like it would actually be a good stopping point for like day one because all of this will have been done and like hopefully somewhat explained. Um, so, mm -hmm. but like if people wanna stick around and like ask questions or like, you know, think about what they want their first 
sewing project to be or their newest sewing project to be like I'm totally down for that as well. I'm just lifting up the fabric to make the marks. Um, as I mentioned before, like it's possible to like puncture this little piece of tissue paper to make the mark like more exact because that way like you don't even have to like remove the pins in order to like get the exact position of the dart. Um, some people do that. I don't do that. I don't like ripping into my um, patterns that kind of happens naturally anyways because it's a very delicate piece of tissue, but it's also, it's just not the end of the world. I don't know. I always think that I'm like the worst, the worst person to be like having any kind of authority on sewing because my thing is like, I'm not a patient person. I'm not like a very like, you know, my whole thing isn't like, oh, I'm just going to get this exactly perfect on the first try. I'm always just like, la di da. Like, I'm sure if I, if I'm, I'm sure if I do this enough times, it'll turn out okay in the end or like, eh, it's going to look a little wrong anyway. So whatever, <laughs> like <laughs> it really does not matter. Relate that's relatable content. <laughs> I think there's like, there's enough, there's, there's people in the world who like love the very slow meditative process of like, every dot has to be being exactly right. Like my darts have to be perfect, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I'm just like, la -dee -da, like it'll be fine. It's gonna look like a piece of clothing in the end. Mm -hmm. There will be fabric on my body, that's fine. So <clears throat> when we take, took that Aneka Truman class, yes. like uh, we first made the cloth out of muslin. Do you do that anymore? Or are you so confident that you don't have to do it anymore? Or no. that's, that's perfectly related to what I was just talking about, which is if you're like actually very patient and good at sewing and you care a lot about exactly how this one particular item of clothing is going to fit you, what you want to do is like make the simplest sloppiest version um, with like no embellishment and de decoration. Um, out of a very cheap cotton fabric. Um, so like for, for example, for this, um, I would like do all this cutting, I would make all the darts, um, but like I might not, you know, cut out the full skirt. Like I might cut out like half of the skirt so I could just see the length of the front because like the fit of the skirt doesn't matter, right? So I would like practically choose um, what parts of the, um, what parts of this I wanted to replicate or like initially in the fabric. And then I would do a foot fit check to make sure that it like fit me correctly. Um, and like, that's called making a muslin. It's extremely useful. Recommend it to everyone who isn't me because the thing is it also like, you don't have to do any kind of finishing or anything. So it should be much faster, but I just like, I'm so lazy that I will just not do it. Um, but yes, it's a good idea. And if you're making anything with like any level of precision or you're making something for someone who is not yourself, um, definitely do it. Just, but yeah, unfortunately I'm not able to be like, it's like a do what I say, not what I do because I never do it. It's not out of confidence. It's because um, it takes like way longer and yeah, yeah. If I were making my own wedding dress, I would make one. <laughs> okay, anyways, this is what a dart looks like when you've um, like drawn it onto the fabric. So this is what the bodice front looks like. And like those darts will like form the bust line area. Does that make sense? Great. Let's see, let's see. Now I'm going to make the markings on midriff front. So like this is going to be the front part of like the other thing that we were cutting out and marking earlier. Um, one thing that's kind of nice is like when you're making a muslin or another thing you can do when you're before you start making something and you're not sure on sizing, which again is not something I'm concerned about with this pattern just because like it doesn't need to be wearable necessarily is like measuring how large something is going to be on your body. So if you measure from the center front to the seam line, 
then you're going to see how long the midriff front is going to be on your midriff. And then patterns will have like lengthen or shorten here lines so that you could cut apart the pattern or fold it up if you wanted it longer or shorter. Um, you can't like say you wanted to like lengthen the bust, like you have to do that in a place where it makes sense that it won't mess with the proportions of the final piece. Um, this is maybe a bad example for that because like you could lengthen this at any, pro any point of the, any point of the pattern. Um, but like you want to maintain proportionality instead of just like, like if you're making a pair of pants and you're lengthening, like by lengthening at the crotch, you're just going to have drop crotch pants. Like, and that won't maintain the proportion of the clothing, even if it's like, even if they're now technically the correct length for your body. Um, that's just what I mean by that. But so yeah, so there's many places at which you can modify a pattern that you're using. Um, and what I love about like working from patterns is that there's no guesswork because the pattern will just tell you. Just making markings. Awesome. I'm flipping it over. Lining it up. Putting this on here backwards. Let's see. Okay. Cool. So this is going to be like the bot, the midriff front. So this goes underneath like the bodice area that I just did. Um, it's like goes around your stomach basically. So that's how that's, that one's going to work. And now for the last pattern piece, um, assuming I don't do the spaghetti strap, which I might, um, for this pattern piece, I'm going to just do the last markings on this. Great. How's everyone doing this this long weekend? Well, yeah, tomorrow's Labor Day. I'm doing good. Good. Labor Day. I didn't even think about that. How perfect. <laughs> about labor. <laughs> oh yeah, it's perfectly fitting. Love talking about labor. Perfect. Okay, great. So that's all the pieces and it's 1243. Um, so we're right on track. That's what today looked like. So I've cut out all the pieces. Um, I've marked them. Um, they're ready to go for tomorrow. Something I'm going to do during the day today, most likely, is when you have woven fabrics, um, which silk is a woven, um, it can fray like really easily. There's some of my pieces are, are already fraying a little. Um, and that's just like, the, here, here's a good example. This one is already fraying. You can see like, just as part of the cutting process, like little fibers are like coming loose, um, which will almost always happen when you're sewing. So what you wanna do is go around the edges with a zigzag stitch um or if you have a surging machine you can use that or if you have pinking shears which are like scissors with little zigzags on them you can cut out with that and that will also prevent fraying um otherwise your clothes i mean it's not going to destroy the clothing it's just going to have slightly less longevity so what i just do is for every single pattern piece i just like sew around the outer edge with a zigzag stitch and it kind of creates like a rolled edge um, it's actually not necessary for every edge, um, but I always forget which ones I don't have to do that for. So I just end up doing like all the edges. It's just easier. I mean, truly like the method to the madness is like being revealed right now, which is just like doing things as you see fit. But 
I wouldn't say it's the end of the world. I have plenty of clothes I've made before. I knew that I was supposed to do this and they're completely fine. They hold up. Um, it's just something that adds longevity to your clothing and prevents like clothing from actually unraveling and like having holes in the seams if they do unravel to that point. Um, so that's something I'm going to do, but I'm not going to make you guys watch the process of because it's extremely boring. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's today. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia. Yes, I really appreciate all of you. Thank you. I'm really happy that um, we got a recording of it. Hi, BP. Thank you and Lydia for coming. Thank you for Thank all the historical stuff. That was like really interesting. Yes, I'm so happy to always talk about that. I think we've really lost sight of like how sewing is such a communal and historically grounded experience. I want to bring that back, hopefully a little bit, a tiny bit, at least in my own communities. So thank you guys for being here. Yeah. And come back tomorrow, same time at 11 a.m. for session number two. Yeah, at least for the like um, sewing ASMR of tomorrow, <laughs> the machine. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia. Bye. You, will you stay on for a minute, Do I want to ask you a question. Sure. Oh. Oh. I don't know who the Galaxy tablet is. That's me. Oh, hi, Mom. Hi. Oh. <laughs> I'm so happy you're here. My mom is the one who taught me how to sew. Aww. Awesome. I didn't teach you to sew, I just um, gave you the inspiration. <laughs> and she taught me the number of times where I, she would just be like, okay, let me do it. Let me do it. Cause I'd be doing a horrible job and like sewing as fast as I could through the whole thing and like just making a mess. <laughs> yeah. Um, now I don't need that anymore and I can't have it because she's gone. But, um, but sometimes I, I know I would do it on purpose just cause I'd be like, I'm tired. I want my mom to fix it. <laughs> 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 Someone help lifeline. <laughs> Well, now you got to do it all in, all by yourself, so. Yeah, uh, seriously sad. But, like, my machine is from her. It's, like, 15 years old and, like, scissors wow. from her. So, yeah, I'm lucky. Mm -hmm. um, but if that's all for today, if you don't need me for anything else, I'll sign off. Okay. Thank Bye. you so much. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for helping with everything with the little um technical issues in the beginning i just really appreciate it so thank you bye bye mommy i love you love you hey doll you i just want to see you tomorrow you. bye see you tomorrow huh? i just want to ask where's the recording are you recording this to the cloud or to your computer to the cloud okay do you know how to get them from the cloud no Okay. But I don't, I'm not logged in. I've never logged into the Zoom. Okay, I'll ask the group. Have you tried? Ha have y'all not tried the doing it to the cloud before? I always uh, save it to my computer. I'm just trying to keep track of them because I want to upload them to YouTube. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, I'll message the group. Do you want it? Okay, you're just going to ask if anyone else knows how to, we can get it from there. I'm sure I can figure it out. I just wanted to set a reminder to people to know 